All right, well, I would like to spend some time talking about the cardiovascular system. Um, and similar to the respiratory system, this is something that uh, works in tandem with other systems in the body. Um, so we can't necessarily think about it as an isolated system, um, but our textbook does a good job of showing how it interfaces largely with the lungs and other parts of the body. So learning objectives, uh, not a lot um, here that I've added from the syllabus is pretty much the same. Although I did, I did mention I've got pulmonary embolism in here. It's just not, it's not listed on these learning objectives. Um, okay, so what we're talking about when we talk about the cardiovascular system is the heart. And so imagine how the heart looks on an x-ray, right? All the, all the arteries, um, not just of the body, but also of the heart, right? Specific arteries going to the heart. Um, to supply it with blood, little capillaries, veins, um, the pulmonary circulation system, and then systemic, systematic circulation, right? So we're not going to spend as much time looking at, for example, the renal arteries or the, you know, the bifurcation of the aorta or something like that today, but do have those structures in the back of your mind. They are significant structures. Um, we're, where we're going to kind of zoom in on is going to be the heart and then the pulmonary arteries. So um, the heart is going to be located uh, more or less midline, but slightly to the left of midline, right? Um, so that area of the heart um, encroaches into the area of the left lung, causing the left lung to be slightly smaller than the right lung, which we talked about last, last week, uh, meaning the left lung has two lobes where the right lung has three, um, and the right main bronchus is larger, right? Uh, the heart, the apex of the heart is its most inferior portion, um, so it's upside down, as it were, which is similar to the patella. Um, where generally the apex means the topmost point, um, both with the heart and the patella, it's, it's the most inferior portion. Um, the atria of the heart are areas of the heart that allow blood to flow into the heart. Um, and so they have uh, specialized valves that allow the blood to enter into the atrium, but then they can't exit the atrium except to enter the ventricle. Right? So the, basically, the, you've got a two-phase pump, something that pumps um, the blood into the atrium and then, from the, and then into the ventricles and then out to wherever it's going, whether that's to the rest of the body or to the lungs. Um, so those right and left ventricles um, have the larger muscles around them because they are responsible for um, causing the blood to pump out into the body. So it's helpful to know uh, what those valves are. I think it's very helpful to know that from, the, from the, the right ventricle, it's exiting the heart through the pulmonary valve, right? Um, and then from the left ventricle, it's exiting the heart through the, was the mitral valve or the aortic valve, I'm sorry, aortic valve. So having those What's nice about the ventricular valves is it tells you where they're going to, right? So I know that from the left, uh, sorry, for the right ventricle, it has to go to the lungs. So it's exiting the heart through the pulmonary valve, pulmonary meaning, meaning lungs. Versus from the left ventricle, it's exiting the heart to go to the aorta. So it has to go through the aortic valve, right? Um, the, other, the other valves in the heart, um, like from the right atrium, you have the, the tricuspid valve, and with the left atrium, you have the, uh, the bicuspid valve. Um, I don't know that there's a really easy way to keep those. In, in my head, I just had to wrote memorize that, um, but I believe there are some quiz questions about that. Um, because the design of those valves, like we're gonna see here in just a, a few moments, um, is significant, um, and I do use design intentionally that over the period of, of years of the evolution of the human heart as well as divine intervention has caused these valves to to be designed in, in particular ways right 
um, and they are given to failure, right? There are, the heart muscle may be perfectly fine, but the valve might break down. And so the way that I generally think about that is similar to like the engine in your car. Your car, the engine may be perfectly fine, but what happens if the seals start to wear out, right? Then you have to replace the seal because it's leaking oil or, or whatever, it's the engine's not working as well. Similar things can happen with those valves in the heart, right? Interestingly enough though, mammalian hearts have very similar valves in them, right? So we can replace those valves with either the valves from a, from a pig heart or perhaps something that's been even now 3D printed, right? So um, the design of them is, is fairly simple. Um, there's layers to the heart um, and the innermost layer is the endocardium. Um, and these are, these are there to protect, to surround, to encase the musculature. Um, and they're fairly thin, right? This endocardium is fairly thin. The myocardium is that muscular layer, layer so you can remember myocardium muscular. Um, it's going to be thicker, and it's, it's innervated. It has muscles, um, and those muscles are very, very powerful muscles, right? Um, and then finally, the epicardium is that outermost la layer, epi meaning outermost. Um, and all of this is encased in a pericardial sac, which similar to um, the, the, plural, the pleura of the lungs is uh, coated with a, with a fluid that just kind of eases the movement of the heart, produces less friction, and allows for the, the heart to be lubricated as it's constantly pumping. Um, <coughs> Now it is also helpful to, to consider the way that the blood travels through the heart, right? That it enters in at the right atrium. Um, from there it goes through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. From there it goes through the pulmonary valve out to the lungs. And from the lungs it comes back into the left atrium through the bicuspid valve, enters the left ventricle, and then through the aortic valve out to the rest of the body. It is re that's very, very essential, especially if you're interested in all in CT, you need to have some idea of how that blood flow works because it very much the, the timing of our scans depends on knowing that once it's entered the right atrium, it's going to be exiting pretty quickly. Um, so our timing is based on uh, how, how that blood is pumped through the heart as well as through the rest of the body. So a lot of information on this. Uh, slide. It is also helpful to have some idea of how this cardiac cycle works. So the time of systole is the contraction period of the heart. It's when the muscle tenses. Um, and then diastole, it relaxes. And it, it works very much like opening and closing your hand. So if you, if you clench your fist, that's the systolic portion of the, of the heart um, rhythm, and then diastole is the relaxation of the heart muscles. Um, there is a sinoatrial uh, node, right, that is essentially an electrical conductor. Um, so it turns nerve impulses into electricity, and that electricity is what stimulates the muscles of the heart and allows them to contract and relax. So we can track, knowing that, that there's this electrical phenomena going on inside the heart, we can track the pulsing of that sinoatrial node, and that's what we're doing when we look at an electrocardiogram. The electro, the electro impulse that we're tracking is coming from that sinoatrial node. Um, so we can, tra we, can, we can travel that out through these different waves. So let's talk about those. Um, now we don't need to get really down in the weeds with this, but it is helpful to know um, in terms of the part that we're interested in is this PR interval. And that's for the amount of time required for the electrical impulse to travel from the, S the sinoatrial node to the ventricular muscle fibers, looking at the textbook on page 90. Um, so when we're looking at this, uh, the little spike on it, that's what I'm talking about, that PR interval. 
um, is the spike that the mus the the electrical impulses travel from the sinoatrial node out to the ventricles. So you can see it's a pretty rapid amount of it's pretty rapid travel because it is again electrical in nature, right? So it's stimulating those muscles and causing them the heart to contract. So what we're seeing in that peak is the contraction of the heart, right? Um, then in that little uh, hang time between uh, what would be the uh, around the T the, around the T there on that little gr graph is the relaxation period. So it's helpful to know this um, because if we know that the peak, that little spike, is the time that the heart is moving, if I'm trying to take a CT scan of this, the most ideal time for it to make the exposure would be when the heart's not moving, right? Um, so during that diastole, during that relaxation phase. So we may talk about um, like EKG gating of CT pulmonary or CT cardiovascular studies, right? These really high-end CT studies. What they're gating, right, is trying to figure out when is the heart in diastole, when is it relaxed, and making the exposure then so that we have a resting heart. It's basically like asking the heart to hold its breath so that we can take a picture of it. But that's going to happen around that T wave, right, that, um, that, that kind of quiet time there. Now, um, blood vessels are fairly complex. They're not like just drinking straws. They have um, an anatomy of their own, right? Um, and so when we look at a blood vessel, um, particularly the arteries, they are designed to withstand a, a tremendous amount of pressure, right? So they have some flexibility to allow for the pressure to be released through the system. Um, but then they are also allowing for sometimes pressure to be built up so the, they can change in size depending on uh, what uh, types of hormonal messaging they're receiving from the rest of the body. So there may be times like during a fight, flight, or freeze response, a stress response of the body, that the blood vessels contract or become smaller in order to, and that increases blood pressure, right? There are other times like during sleep when the system relaxes and the blood vessels um, dilate and allow for a more less pressure in the system. But when we look at the actual blood vessels, these arteries, um, this outermost layer is the adventia. I think I'm pronouncing that right. That's the outermost portion of it. Um, there's a media, which is the middle, middle portion, and then the antima and the lumen. The lumen is the actual hole, right? The hole through which the, uh, the blood travels. So when we talk about um, something traveling through the lumen of an artery, which you do quite a bit in interventional. They're talking about just the passageway that can move through it. That is, a, it's an empty space, but it's, it's important. It allows the blood, the blood cells to pass through it. So when we look at things like um, arthrosclerosis, we're concerned primarily with the integrity of the entima, right? That there's plaque or there's buildup which in the entima, which is then occluding the lumen of the blood vessel, causing blood not to flow through the lumen. Versus if we look at things like um, uh, aortic bifurcation or tears in the aorta, those, those kinds of things where like a normal healthy person just drops dead. Um, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, pretty serious stuff. Um, we're talking about the media, that it's sheared away from the entima, and the media itself now is kind of flapping in the breeze, as it were. There's, there's blood vessels all around it. Um, so that we, have to, we have to be aware of that. If we see that, in, if we see something, for example, on a CT scan where there is that tear or that jagged um, appearance on the inside, on the lumen of the, the blood vessel, that should not be there. It is probably not plaque. It is probably the media that's sheared away from the, from the vascular wall and is there stuck, stuck in the lumen. Veins are a little bit simpler. Um, they are mostly there just to receive blood. And then the capillaries are those things that are situated between the arteries and the veins, which allow for gas exchange. So the primary purpose of this cardiovascular system is to deliver air 
or oxygen more correctly from the lungs to the cells of the body, right? So it takes oxygenated, it oxygenates the blood in the lungs and then pumps that through the, the left ventricle, the aorta, out through the rest of the body so that all the cells of the body can have oxygen. That gas exchange between the blood and the cells of the body happen at the capillaries. So if you, if you want to think about it, um, I think about it a lot like a highway system. I think that's one of the most helpful things, helpful ways to think about it. Where you have the arteries are like the interstate. They just kind of power through things. And you, you're not going to be able to stop at, you know, the grocery store if you're on the interstate, unless you're in Texas for some reason. Um, but you just kind of power through things on the interstate. Uh, versus uh, once we get to these smaller peripheral arteries, we're like on the little, little city streets, and the capillaries are those streets where we can stop, we can go to the grocery store, we can go to the gas station, those types of things, right? Um, so that's the way that I tend to think about it. Um, there's not gas exchange happening in, the, in like the aorta. It is not facilitating gas exchange. You have to get down to a really, really small level at the level of the capillary before basically the gas is squeezed out of the red blood cells and nutrients and other things are delivered to the cells. All of, all of this stuff um, is significant radiographically. Um, so when we're looking at a chest x-ray, we are seeing suggestions of many of these things there on that chest x-ray. And if we train our eyes, we will be able to see those things as well. And so these discussions about pressure, the discussions about motion and the beating of the heart, all of those things are there on the chest radiograph. We've taken a photograph that captures that in a frozen moment of time. So one of the most uh, obvious things that we would see on a chest x-ray is cardiomegaly, right? The cardiomegaly is not just an enlarged heart, I mean, although that is what that means, so it is important to know that the term means the heart is enlarged. So if the heart is enlarged, I would expect it to see it occupying a larger portion of the left lung as well as even some of the right lung now. It's crossed the midline and it's now um, encroaching on both lungs. Why? Because the heart is enlarged and it sits so closely with the lungs, right? But that tells me something about the processes that are going on in the heart as well. Generally, we understand that cardiovagally, with some other signs, is a, an aspect of congestive heart failure. So if we kind of think about what that means, congestive heart failure, it means that the heart is like my sinuses right now, right? It is full of junk, right? And when something is full of junk, it tends to enlarge, right? Which is exactly what's happening in congestive heart failure, right? Um, we will be able to see radiographically those great vessels. And so um, right now the juniors are looking at chest x-ray and I ask them to identify the aortic arch, you know, or the, the, um, the ascending aorta, descending aorta, things like that on the chest radiograph. They are apparent there, um, but we kind of have to use our imagination with them, right? Because they're oriented funny. Um, like if I'm looking straight on at the chest x-ray, I kind of have to imagine it being like my hand, right? And so I can imagine the ascending aorta coming up to my thumb, the arch of the aorta arching more posteriorly, right? And then the descending aorta being like my uh, pointer finger, right? And so what I'm seeing on the, on the chest x-ray looks more like, um, it doesn't look like this where I can see a nice neat arch, right? It looks more like I'm seeing the arch from the side, which is exactly what we're seeing. Um, but we are able to detect anomalies in those greater vessels, which we'll look at in some of these pediatric um, cases of uh, certain uh, congenital or hereditary defects of the circulatory system. We'll be able to see that very clearly. Something's going on with those greater vessels. That's what great vessels means, is things like the aorta and the pulmonary arteries. Now, if there are certain things going on in the heart, they can influence uh, things within the lungs. Right? Um, so pneumothorax, which we've looked at already, um, not necessarily tied with the heart, but we would be able to, it would deface the lung markings. Pulmonary emphysema, um, so that causes again defacement of the lung markings. But if we are suspecting congestive heart failure, the lungs will give us evidence that there is increased pressure in the lungs as well. So we get signs like curly B lines, and I'm not going to ask you to identify these because they're very, very subtle, and frankly, they, 
I don't think that they're very often apparent on the monitors that we use. We need the fancy high-end radio radio radiologist monitors to see these curly B lines or curly C lines. But they're lung markings that are indicative of additional pressure in the heart, right? So the lung is being impacted by the congestive heart failure as well. So I put pneumothorax and pulmonary emphysema up here because those are things that we can see on our 1K monitors. Just understand that there's, also, there's similar things going on when the radiologists are looking at to rule out congestive heart failure. They see the cardiomegaly and then they start zooming in on the lungs immediately to look at what's going on with the lungs that might further support that finding. Of course, we have all the uh, bony thorax, and some of these things can affect the heart. So when we look, for example, at a scoliosis series, it is, you know, commonly understood it's going to be impossible to get a perfect lateral on a scoliosis series, right? Because of the twisting and curvatures of the spine brought on by that disorder. Um, those changes in the bony anatomy influence the orientation of the heart as well, right? So if you look from the scoliosis series, if you follow the, the thoracic spine, you will see some changes. If you look at the heart, you will also see some changes related to scoliosis, um, partic particularly pronounced cases of scoliosis. Pectus excavatum, which we've, we've looked at some, um, so those cases where the, where the sternum has a, has a more or less like a divot or it curves inward, um, that presses directly on the heart, which is one of the main reasons why um, if they're going to correct it surgically, they will, because it's starting to, as the individual grows, particularly in puberty, through their teenage years, that, that excavatum, that hole, um, as it were, in the, in the chest, starts to influence the way that the heart is working. Um, so it can cause weakening of the cardiac muscles because of friction and all sorts of other things. So as we're looking at chest radiographs, um, we y'all have done a good job of kind of considering all the patient positioning factors, um, and I know that y'all are thinking about these every day, right? Geometrical factors, um, the way that the patient's anatomy influences how we set things up, um, and then learning a little bit of critique. Um, now I, I will say that the chest radiograph is one of the most commonly performed radiographic procedures. It is very difficult to perfect right? Uh, particularly the lateral. Um, so you'll do a lot of them, but doing them perfectly every time is a struggle because of changes with the patient and things like that. So we can see instances where it looks like with this patient we probably shouldn't have used a portrait style orientation, probably should have used a landscape style orientation, but if we use the landscape style orientation we're gonna have to lower the bucky some right in order to get the costophrenic angle. So we're constantly trying to fit this piece of anatomy uh, on the image receptor um, and it, it makes for some some difficult stuff. Now we do not have, because of the physiological um, richness of what's happening in the cardiovascular system, um, the lion's share of imaging of the heart specifically is done by other modalities. So if we're talking about the heart and ways to get pictures of the heart, X-ray is not it, right? Um, X-ray can give us a general lay of the land. We can see things like cardiomegaly and other things that are suggestive of congestive heart failure. We can evaluate the lungs. Um, but to really see how the heart is working, right, we need to look at other modalities. So um, we've got things like echocardiography, which is going to be done on ultrasound. And when anytime I think about echocardiography or these different forms of um, cardiography, um, just just know it's very similar to the Doppler radar that's used on your afternoon weather, right? What is measuring the Doppler effect? Uh, are we familiar with this term? It's, it's the change in pitch that occurs as things are traveling toward you. So what am I talking about? If you've ever sat by a train track and watched a train go by, just the train whistle sounds different as it passes, right? It's like, right? That's a really bad version of a train. Weird thing about the train whistle, it's making the same note. 
What's shifting is your perception of the sound waves. As it's accelerating towards you, the sound waves are bunching up on themselves, right? Um, and so it's causing the pitch to fall off as the train approaches. So not only is the volume changing, which is true, the volume is definitely changing, the pitch is changing, right? That's what we're measuring when we look at things like Doppler. We're looking at the sound, as it were, of that approaching train down the blood vessels. We're standing by the, by the track, watching the blood vessels fly by, and we're listening to the change in sound that they make. A very similar process is being used in MRI. Um, uh, what are they? I can't remember the name of it. There's an MRI study that they use. Same basic process, right? Uh, using the Doppler effect to monitor how quickly blood is flowing through these blood vessels. Um, when they're doing this, though, um, oftentimes they need to be pretty close to where the great vessels are. Um, so they do what they call transesophageal echocardiography, TEE. -E. What they do is they have the patient swallow a probe, right? The probe goes down the esophagus and to the level of the heart, and now they're doing the Doppler measurements deep inside the patient's body. They're able to evaluate how the blood is flowing through all these little cardiac vessels. You can also monitor the um, flexing of the heart muscles themselves, right? And they get us some very, very accurate um, physiological studies of the heart and the blood vessels, right? The beating of the heart, the movement of blood through the blood vessels, and we can see all sorts of things like stenosis, deep brain thrombosis. Um, we can stress the heart some, we can cause them to do some exercise or have them on a treadmill while we're doing this so that we can see um, if what this arrhythmia is, where it originates from, and things like that. So I don't expect any of us to be um, ultrasound techs, and I don't necessarily expect you to look at these awful pictures here and tell me what these various things are, right? Um, I cannot look at this image, uh, particularly up here on the, on the top uh, right, and identify that that's the mitral valve, right ventricle, etc., right? Um, especially not on a still frame. Uh, what is what we need to understand though, if you see the little uh, EKG lead, uh, pattern on the bottom, generally these images are viewed as a video, similar to fluoroscopy. You're actually seeing the heart beat on this. And so you're seeing, for example, the mitral valve open and close, right? And then it's pretty obvious. Oh, that must be an atrium. That must be a ventricle. So if you have opportunities to go into, uh, to see anything that they're doing with, uh, with echo in the, in the cath lab or what have you, I would encourage you to go see that because they, they get some very interesting real-time images of the heart beating. Um, and you can see we can track that onto uh, blood pressure changes um, and all sorts of things. So this image on the bottom is the Doppler image and we're seeing the, how the blood's flowing through. In this case, it looks like the the ICA, so the inner, what's that, the inner coronary artery, something like that. Um, so we're able to evaluate at the level of the coronary arteries, how's the blood flowing? Is, there's a, is there a stenosis there? Is there some kind of blockage that could eventually contribute to something like a myocardial infarction, a heart attack? Nuclear cardiology is another very helpful study to have done. Um, now, there is, I'll tell you this, with both ultrasound and nuke med, there is some physician bias against these studies, right? Because if you look at them, it does take a trained eye to look at that ultrasound and say, yeah, that's the mitral valve, right? Um, you have to have some understanding of physics, you need to understand the Doppler effect, you need to understand how these ultrasound images are produced um, in terms of the mechanics of it to look at this, right, and to say that. Um, so, for, uh, for example, an ER physician, they may not understand all of that. Their focus has not been so much on physics, right, as other things like how to stitch up wounds. And so they can't necessarily just jump into ultrasound mode and start making determinations on how best to proceed with the patient. Uh, so there is some a bias against it. Um, 
same is definitely true with nucle nuclear cardiology. So this uh, can be used to uh, diagnose things like, uh, like CAD or uh, any kind of congenital heart disease, uh, cardiomyopathy. Um, and what it's allowing us to see is the physiology of the heart. How is the blood perfusing through the tissues of the heart? Are there areas of the heart that are not receiving sufficient nutrients, right? Are there areas of the heart where stenosis is causing the beginnings of heart failure? So that's what we're looking at when we look at a myocardial perfusion study, right? They've introduced some kind of radioisotope to the patient's uh, blood system. Um, and now we can look and see this chest pain that the patient's having of unknown origin. We're not seeing anything on the CT scan. We're not seeing anything on the x-rays. Is there something going on at the level of the heart where the heart's not getting enough oxygen? The heart's not getting enough nutrients. So this is typically used to evaluate coronary um, artery stenosis and as a follow-up to bypass surgery. So after the bypass surgery, let's get the myocardial perfusion scan done the next day and see how well the bypass worked. Um, we can do these uh, gated cardiac pool scans, which I've, I've personally never seen, but it says in the textbook they're used to evaluate the ventricles. And then, of course, positron emission tomography. Now, generally, when we talk about PET scans, what we're talking about is it being used with FDG, so used with sugar molecules to evaluate for cancer, right? Can we have cancer in the heart? Yes, we can. Um, but we could also use other uh, molecules, other uh, radioisotopes to evaluate different functions of the heart. So can it be used to look for cancer? Yes, it can. It can be also used to look at physiology of the heart. And when that you're, if you're wondering at all about what am I talking about when I, I mentioned how difficult it is to look at these images, this is what I'm talking about, right? Um, I have no clue what I'm looking at on this picture, right? Um, but just know that these different brightness values are related to different uptake values of the radioisotopes. So what we're tracking is how, the word they use is avid, how avid different tissues are for different substances, right? Um, so particularly with PET scans, they're looking at sugar avidity, right? How, ad, how much does this stuff like sugar, right? Um, and I know if it likes sugar a lot, it has to be cancer, right? That's literally what we're looking at. FDG is glucose. It is a radioisotope tagged sugar molecule, cancer like sugar. If I see a whole lot of brightness here, like if it's super intensely bright in some area, I know that stuff really likes sugar. It's got to be cancer. So I'm seeing it at that physiological level. Um, so the power of PET-CT is taking these physiological images here where I cannot see any anatomy on this at all. Like with ultrasound, maybe if I was watching it beat, I could see the mitral valve. Here I'm not seeing anything anatomy-wise, right? All I'm seeing is purely physiology. How avid is it for different materials, right? But if I can layer that over or fuse that with a CT image that shows deta detailed images of anatomy, then I have a very powerful study. I also have a very large patient radiation dose, so we have to use it with some wisdom. CT is helpful as well, and y'all have probably already seen a little bit of CT. Has anyone been on a CT rotation yet? A few, a few of us, not a lot, but a few. Um, but maybe if, you, if we've been at some of these smaller facilities, hopefully you've had an opportunity to glance into the CT department, see a little bit of what they do. Um, with CT, we have a number of different um, ways that we can look at imaging of the heart. Uh, so there's just general CT, routine CT, not very well adapted to imaging of the heart. We can see um, some of what we'd want to see, but we're not going to be able to see, for example, coronary arteries or something like that with a routine CT scan. Um, cardiac scoring is similar to the routine CT scan, but we're using an artificial intelligence. This is probably one of the first places that AI was used for, to aid diagnosis, right? So um, the radiologists, when this first rolled out, really didn't have to do much of anything. They would just look and say, yeah, it looks like We've got certain amounts of calcium. 
because this cardiac scoring, what it's doing is it's scanning just the heart and it's looking at the amount of plaque in those coronary arteries and it's actually grading the amount of plaque. It's using the linear attenu attenuation value of plaque, which is largely calcium, so it's similar to bone, and it's saying if this linear attenuation value is this high in relationship to other things, then there must be a lot of plaque there. So the AI then scores the heart based on the amount of plaque seen in the coronary arteries. Electron beam CT is one of those things that has largely gone the way of the dodo. We do not do it very much. When I first started out at the facility that I was at, there was an EBCT scanner. It was not in the radiology department. It was in the cardiology department. So this was a bid by cardiologists to take over all of the heart scanning that was being done, right? It was EBT CT. And the reason it was used, this electron beam CT scan, if you can imagine, it's kind of strange. You have a patient laying on a table, right? And this is really weird to think about. But what they did was, in order to facilitate more rapid fire scanning, right, they had an electron gun that was shooting at a target that totally surrounded the patient. So the target, the patient's essentially inside of the x-ray tube, if you can imagine. Um, not just inside of the CT tube, I, I said that right, they are inside of the x-ray tube, right? And you are shooting electrons at an anode that surrounds the patient. You tracking with me? And then that's causing x-rays from all directions to interface with the patient's heart. The reason they did that was because this was before we had really high-tech CT technology, and if you wanted to take a picture of this heart that's rapidly beating, you needed to create pictures that much more quickly, right? So we do not use EBT, EBCT anymore. I don't know of any facility that's doing it, but it was something that cardiologists did prior to the advent of CTA cardio studies, right? The thing that made it completely obsolete, and I saw this, was the advent of multi-detector spiral CTs and CT angiography. That was this kind of earthquake moment, right? And the reason I'm stressing it is because this earthquake moment, right, happened to coincide with some of the stuff that we're looking at in radiation biology. So that rapid acceleration in CT usage, you know, when we look at um, what is NCRB report number 160 and we see that CT scan becomes that big wedge of the pie for, who, what, for radiation exposure to the U.S. public, it was because of these um, increases in the technology. Now we can use CT to look at the heart. Now we can use CT to look at the coronary arteries, right? It just eclipsed everything else. It be, kind of became this dominant force in imaging. And it, it, was, it was intense. Like there was politics, there were people fighting. I remember when we first did the CTA cardio studies in my department, in the room while I'm doing this study, I've got a radiologist, I've got the chief surgeon of the hospital, I've got a cardiologist, all of them with terrible halitosis, breathing down my neck while I'm trying to do this freaking study, right? Because they're, they're there trying to mediate a serious fight that they're having about who should have this technology. And it was a big deal, it was, it was a big deal. So very powerful, very specific study. Um, it'll probably be the main way for those of us in this room, apart from occasionally MRI will continue to develop some ability to, to, to look at the heart. But for those of you right now, within the next year, if you're going to jump into imaging of the heart, CT is probably the first, most likely way you would interface with heart imaging. So you've got some uh, understanding of that, uh, that type of studies. Now CT is prone to the same problems that we have in x-ray, right? So here's two examples of issues that can happen with CT studies. Um, uh, so here's uh, a, a very, uh, an, an aortic aneurysm, right? We have, see that huge aorta, it's about the size of that uh, lumbar spine verte vertebral body, right? And it's even got some plaque around it, so you can see that kind of rim of white around it. Are we seeing this? I can indicate it on the image. 
So this is the aorta, descending aorta, and this white right here is crud. Right, along the inside of the aorta. The main problem going on here is the aneurysm. The aorta is much too large, um, but there's this secondary problem of arthrosclerosis going on. Um, but what's the other issue with this image? Well, there's a metal artifact, right? And in fact, arthrosclerosis can create an artifact. So if I'm trying to look at the heart, and I've got a whole lot of plaque in those uh, coronary arteries, that can cause an artifact, right? So it is prone to artifacts. We're getting uh, better and better ways uh, within the software to, to get around those artifacts. Um, here's another example of an artifact on a CT image that's definitely impactful. We have breathing. The patient does not have buzzsaw skin, right? They have not developed some weird uh, disorder of their belly, right? They're breathing motion. They're breathing quite a bit during this scan, right? And so we see that heaving up and down of uh, not just the skin, but all those internal organs. They're all blurry. All the parts of the small bowel that I'm seeing on this are blurry. It's making it more difficult to see the aorta. So m breathing motion, motion of the heart, all of those things are going to be impactful to CT imaging. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we do things like cardiac gating, why we watch our contrast levels and want to time our injections to where they match up with the contrast being where we want it to be. Okay, another area that you may interface with cardiovascular is a fairly uh, newly emerging field, but it shows a lot of promise, and this is MRI. Um, so we are starting to see more uh, cardiac studies being done in MRI. I was at DIS, I guess it was about a year ago now, and they were starting to do MRI cardio there, and they were beautiful pictures. Like they're, You can actually see the little tiny muscle fibers of the heart on these images, so they have a tremendous amount of specificity. And the interesting advantage with MRI is we can get some images of the heart actually beating, and they're, they're again, quite impressive images of the heart beating. They're, they're some of the prettiest pictures I've ever seen. Um, so we can use these cine loops. Again, we're going to do the ECG gating. Um, and anytime you see uh, EKG or ECG gating, just know in the back of your mind, we may be having to give the patient some kind of drug, right? If you see that gating note there, know that the protocol may have the additional requirement of giving the patient a drug to reduce the heart rate or allowing the patient to lay on the table for about five, 10 minutes before doing the procedure because we want that resting heart rate, right? Especially with MRI. The thing I was trying to think of earlier was MRA. Um, MRA does not use contrast, which is really, really interesting because as a CT tech, Anytime I see angiogram, I'm thinking contrast. As an interventional technologist, for the most part, anytime you see angiogram, you're thinking, inject the patient with a lot of contrast. MRA, of course, MR being developed by space aliens needs to be completely different from everyone else. MRA uses the Doppler effect. So it stole the Doppler effect from ultrasound, and it's using the Doppler effect to provide contrast inside of the arteries which is really crazy when you think about it, that it's able to sample the Doppler effect of blood vessels and blood cells as it's doing all these other crazy wave controls and gradient controls and stuff that Deborah's been talking to you about. Really, really wild. But here's an example of the kind of really pretty pictures that we can get of the heart as it's actually beating uh, using MRA. And of course, we can't get past the cardiovascular system without talking about angiography. This is the original way that um, any kind of cardiovascular imaging was done. Um, uh, it is awesome. It's, it's fascinating to, to see. Um, and the way that this works um, is we are going to introduce a, a catheter either to the arterial system or to the venous system and we're gonna travel through that catheter to the area of interest, right? Um, so that's what that interventional means. It means we're in introducing something to the cardiovascular system and we're traveling down the cardiovascular system like in this tiny submarine to the area of interest and then we're gonna use the fluoroscope 
to get images and to guide a procedure at the area of interest. Now, um, this is really frequently done for cardiovascular disease, and it changed the playing field in its own day, right, for things like cardiovascular surgery, stent placement, um, things in the aorta, a a aneurysm repair can be now be done uh, uh, interventionally without surgery. So the patient can even just be mildly sedated with Valium and you're basically working on their heart while they're just laying there talking to you about whatever people talk about when they're on Valium, right? Yacht rock mostly, I think. Um, it can be diagnostic or it can be therapeutic. Um, the diagnostic portion of it is we can actually use it to just go to the area of interest and, and evaluate for stenosis, things like that. Um, therapeutic means if we evaluate there is a stenosis there, we can introduce some kind of balloon or something to, you know, kind of clean. I imagine them plunging a toilet basically inside my heart and cleaning out some kind of plaque there, right? I'm sorry, that's, I'm a guy, and when I'm explaining to my sons, that's what I explain to them. Now, uh, I want to point out something about this, uh, these images. Where are the bones on this person, right? Yes, good. They use... <laughs> Magic, the magic of bone subtraction to get rid of the bones, right? So um, all we're seeing is the arteries. Um, so they do some magical stuff like that. Uh, I want to point out that these studies, for the most part, are really high dose rate, especially if we're looking at the heart, very high dose rate. And almost all the sentinel events we've had recently at certain um, facilities that will go unnamed, because this is going on YouTube, have been in the interventional cardio cath lab, right? And those machines are not necessarily being run by radiologists. They're being run, again, by cardiologists because of that old turf war that I talked about. And they got lead foot. So they are just sitting there berating the hell out of people. Is it okay? And I'm going to say, yes, it is, because they're working on a, my freaking heart, and they're plunging out my heart, right? So you can burn me all day long if you want, as long as you get this gunk out of my heart, right? So that's kind of the philosophy there. Be aware of that. And generally, there's not an x-ray tech in that room, so you can be grateful for that. But wear a double lead apron if you do go in that room. So therapeutic stuff that we can do, these are percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty. So this is stuff like putting in stents, thrombolysis, which means we introduce weird drugs that dis dissolve. They're like the, uh, like the Drano of the cardiovascular system. They basically burn away plaque and stuff like that. I really have no clue how these things work. I just know that they have to be targeted, so they must be pretty intense, right? Um, so it is like a caustic chemical that burns away plaque, right? You would not want it running through your whole body. You would want it just to be targeted to the area where the plaque is, and then embolization. So we can actually create an embolus, right? in order to block something off. If we say, you know what, that part of the heart is dead, we don't need any more blood flowing down there, it's pointless, it's dead. We can embolize it, we can cause the blood to not flow that direction anymore. There's this transjugular stuff, so now they're going down through your jugular, um, looking at the, uh, the portal system of the, the, uh, the liver, um, percutaneous transluminal angioplasty, and then permanent catheterization. Um, so things like heart catheters, um, uh, catheterization of the uh, aorta, stuff like that. So here's an example of one of these procedures where um, it looks like they've come up through uh, the aorta and they're placing something around the area of the heart. So it looks like this patient's had a previous heart, heart problems, and now they're, they're placing a stent or some kind of sleeve, um, either in the aorta or around the area of the heart. All right, so it is time for some fun with friends, all right? Okay, so in order to understand some of the congenital and hereditary diseases, um, which are quite frequent in infants, especially premature infants, um, because of the way that development of the heart works. Um, we need to understand differences in the fetal circulatory system. So 
One of the primary differences is that the heart is actually not doing much of any work um, in utero. So there is a point of communication called the foramen ovale, which um, allows for um, circulation uh, into the heart, right? Um, and then there's this ductus arteriosus, which allows for basically to bypass the heart's um, atrium, right? Bypass the ventricles. So, um, in the incidence of uh, premature birth, those openings may not have fully closed. The septum may not be fully closed there. So, we'll look at that here in just a moment. Um, when we're talking about the etiology of various congenital abnormalities, there, it coincides with other genetic disorders and chromosomal uh, um, aberrations like for example uh, uh, Down syndrome um, we're talking about roughly one case of some kind of heart problem um, per 120 live births so this is pretty frequent um, and you can imagine in the past the kinds of problems that would have been associated with this um, we have ways to um, improve the survival rate for a lot of this stuff now. When we talk about environmental factors, so we've, we've, we've talked some about genetic disorders and chromosomal aberrations. When we talk about environmental factors um, for fetal development, the environment that we're talking about is essentially the mother's body. Um, so, for example, things like whether or not the mother is drinking alcohol, whether or not the mother is smoking cigarettes. Those are environmental factors for the fetus. Um, an increased stress level for the mom. The mom's age at the time of pregnancy are additional environmental factors um, that can influence and generally increase possible of all sorts of heart problems. Um, there's associated complications with things like prematurity or some of these environmental factors. Probably the most common one is a heart murmur heard at birth. Um, generally, these things resolve as the um, infant progresses and, and, and gets older. If it doesn't, then it's indicative of something else going on. So a murmur is specifically a sound that you can hear on stethoscope. Um, it's kind of an additional kind of uh, noise in the heart where you would just want to hear the heartbeat. First thing we'll look at in terms of uh, congenital or hereditary diseases um, is related primarily to premature birth. Um, so in the event that this circulatory system, the bypass that I talked about that's there um, during fetal development, if it does not close off, um, if it doesn't close at birth, what we have is a patent ductus arteriosus, patent just meaning um, that it's still open. Um, this is very common with pre premature infants, and the textbook says approximately 80% of infants born before 28 weeks will have patent ductus arteriosus. Um, so generally, uh, What's going to what's going to happen is as the left ventral contr ventricle contracts, it will pump blood um, back uh, into the pulmonary trunk um, via that open uh, patent uh, ductus arteriosus. Treatment for this um, largely consists of we will we'll evaluate. We'll make sure it's just a patent ductus arteriosus. We'll see. Um, if it's not related to um, the premature birth, we may have to do some kind of surgical procedure to close it. But generally, if it is related to prematurity, um, we're going to use some drugs um, to treat this. Um, surgery is really a last resort for premature infants for a number of reasons. Prog prognosis is generally good. Um, for the most part, uh, and if we've got a full-term infant, um, it, it, should be, it should be fine, it should resolve on its own.
So here's a picture uh, demonstrating that. Um, the image on the uh, the image on the left is an aortogram. Um, so they've introduced uh, contrast, and then they, if you can imagine, this is a very small patient. So they've introduced contrast, and they're just taking a picture of the aorta with contrast in it. Um, the image on the uh, the right is an MRI image of the same condition. In that PDA is not public display of affection, it's patent ductus arteriosus, right, on that image. All right, so coarctation of the aorta is next on our list. Um, let's talk a little bit about this, what we found out about it on our textbook. Okay, these septal defects can be pretty serious. Um, so, there can either be a defect in um, the ventricular septum or a defect in the atrial septum. And what I'm talking about when I talk about the septum is that it's a very stiff wall that separates the atrium. They sit right next to it, right and left, and that wall that separates them is that septum, right? Same is true down with at the level of the ventricles. So essentially what the septum allows for is that the same basically muscular movements can control both ventricles and can control both atrium, right? So it allows for a joint muscle movement to force blood through different areas, right? Um, if there's a problem in that septal wall, that wall between the atrium or that wall between the uh, ventricles, what we're talking about is a septal defect. So if there's blood flowing from atrium to atrium, or blood flowing from ventricle to ventricle, that's a problem, right? Um, it's uh, basically similar to if you had a pipe burst in your house, right? Mm -hmm. We've got now water where we didn't want water, right? Um, so this can cause uh, enlargement of the heart, um, problems with the vasculature around the heart, um, and a number of other things. So this is about 10% um, of, uh, of all causes of congenital heart disease, again, according to the textbook. The things that we're going to allow us to look at this are going to be ultrasound, right? So Doppler ultrasound imaging will allow us to look at these things, um, at particularly the echocardiography. Um, when we look at it on an x-ray, uh, we may see um, enlargement of the ventricles, um, so some cardiomegaly, um, and uh, we also might see an increased amount of blood flow to the lungs, depending on which septum, it, septum is, is acting up. For the most part, we're talking about surgery to treat this. So here is uh, just an illustration showing um, different uh, septal defects. So the image on the left is showing an atrial septal defect, and on the right we're seeing a ventricular septal defect. And so the arrows are helpful and they allow us to, to see how these types of things could cause uh, strange kind of blood flow, increase in, in heart size, things like that. All right. Probably one of the scariest um, congenital things that can happen with the heart is the transposition of the great vessels. This is not compatible with life. It means that um, after birth, if this is not corrected pretty quickly, the child will not survive. Right? Um, so this is, this is pretty scary stuff. At the same time, it's uh, fairly rare. Um, so normally what we should have is the aorta connected to what? The aorta should be connected to the, the left ventricle, correct? And the pulmonary artery should be connected to the right ventricle. In this case, it's flip-flopped, right? So if you can imagine, what we've created is, is two closed systems now where on the left side of the heart, I'm just circulating blood to the lungs. All I'm doing on the left side of the heart is circulating blood to the lungs. So I've got really oxygenated blood, but it's not going out to the body. 
on the right side of the heart, I'm just circulating blood to and from the body. I'm just circulating blood to and from the body. So I've got incredibly deoxygenated blood that's not being reoxygenated. So this closed system, that's why I'm saying it's incompatible with life. You can imagine the kinds of problems that would come with that. And we'll have an illustration that looks at it in just, in just a moment. Um, <clears throat> so this needs to be treated immediately. Um, and a lot of times we do echocardiography, again, to look at how that blood is flowing, right? Because if I just see blood flowing from the right side to the body, um, I've got a definitive diagnosis there. Is this where we have on before the baby is born? I don't have an answer on that one. I generally, it needs to be found shortly after birth, right? So child looks cyanotic, they're blue, there's clearly not oxygen in the, in the, in the blood vessels then quickly diagnosed and treated. Um, most of the stuff that we're able to diagnose, in my opinion, from what I've understood, prior to birth, there is some heart stuff we can look at on ultrasound. There's also some brain stuff we can look at on ultrasound. Um, but I don't have a, a definitive answer on that. I'll ask uh, my colleagues and see what I can find out. Great question. So here's another one of those contrast studies seen on an infant. And you can see what a mess this is. Um, where normally we wouldn't want to see any of this contrast where we're seeing it. Um, we are only seeing blood flowing basically up through the inferior vena cava into the atrium and then directly into the aorta, right? Um, and there's absolutely no oxygen in that blood. Um, so this illustration here on the left shows us exactly what we're talking about. And transposition of the greater vessels means just that that you've got them transposed. Okay, tetralogy of Fallot um, is a kind of one of those like combo moves on Mortal Kombat type things. It's describing a four things that are wrong and they're all wrong together in a way that's kind of compounding, right? Um, so it's a combination of defects um, and those include pulmonary stenosis, ventricular septal defect, um, overriding the aorta, and a hypertrophy of the right ventricle, right? It's in the, it's in the text, but um, pulmonary stenosis, ventricular septal defect, overriding aorta, and hypertrophy of the right ventricle. Hypertrophy of the right ventricle. So you can see they've drawn that here. They've thickened the wall the uh, the media of that um, cardio that the, the the heart's wall, and that's what we're talking about. That the the hypertrophy means thickening of the muscles in that right ventricle. So all all four of those are on this illustration here. Um, this diagnosis uh, frequently will be done. Let me see. It doesn't say in the text. I'm not seeing a, a diagnostic criteria for this. Um, it says it says enlargement of the right ventricle, which we would expect, but it doesn't say what that on what modality we would see that enlargement. Um, but then uh, this will require some kind of corrective surgery in terms of treatment. All right, so. Now, valvular diseases um, are kind of just out there in a classification by themselves, right? Some of these could be genetic in nature. Some of them have to do with lifestyle choices. Um, some of them may just, uh, we may never fully understand what's causing it. It may just be uh, that the valve itself um, is damaged, right? So. Just understand this is not necessarily, I'm, I'm switching gears from a discussion of congenital heart defects to valvular stuff. Um, symptoms of, of valvular diseases um, are going to be things like dyspnea, fatigue, um, chest pain, and we may be able to hear it. We may hear a murmur there. Uh, so those are the kinds of clinical findings we may hear as well. Um, 
we can use non-invasive techniques um, to assess this. Um, and then there's also invasive things, like we may have to actually go in um, surgically in order to make this diagnosis. Um, if there's uh, chronic uh, valve disease, this can be brought on by things like rheumatic fever. And if you can imagine, um, if you've got inflammation going on, particularly in the heart, how that inflammation could ultimately wind up causing problems with the valves. Right? The valves would start to stick because of the inflammatory process going on. So here's illustrations of different types of stenosis. Um, so we have mitral valve prolapse, right? Um, and we've, we've probably heard a little bit about bladder prolapse and stuff. Here, basically the same kind of thing is going on. Um, this mitral valve is not allowing blood to flow into the atrium, right? Um, because it's stenosed. It's, it's not, it's uh, closed so tightly it's not opening very well. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I may have said atrium. I meant to say ventricle. I apologize for that. Um, so if we have, um, we can also have uh, a valve that's open, that's staying open, right? And it's allowing blood to backflow from the ventricle into atrium. We'll look at that here in just a moment. Um, this is a, a chest x-ray. You've probably seen something like this before on an x-ray. Here we have uh, some kind of surgical implant there holding the valves intact and allowing for the valves to continue to work. Oftentimes valves are going to be replaced surgically um, if they're, especially if they're kind of continuing to um, experience problems with their breathing or with their fatigue, stuff like that. All right, congestive heart failure, CHF. All righty. Tell us a little bit about... Con okay. Core pulmonale. Um, this results from a lung disorder, right, that causes hypertension, specifically in the pulmonary artery, and it's going to cause enlargement of the right ventricle. So the lung condition is causing increased pressure in the pulmonary artery and right ventricle, right? Um, this is causing the heart to work that much more uh, difficultly. So here we have an example of something like uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Something is obstructing the lungs and that's causing increased pressure on the heart, right? So here's a great example of cardiomegaly right, being caused by something going on in the lungs. So we would expect to see right-sided cardiomegaly. Why? Because of the increased pressure caused by COPD. Um, these patients frequently will experience uh, chest pain. A chest x-ray will demonstrate, again, right-sided cardiomegaly, right, as well as some lung markings indicative of uh, the COPD and things like that. Um, these folks are going to be at an increased risk for venous thrombosis, right? And if you think about why that might be the case, um, if you've got pressure, right, for the blood going to the lungs, that's reducing pressure on the blood flowing from the heart back to the rest of the body, right? So increased pressure getting to the lungs is decreasing pressure coming from the lungs, right? It's almost as if you had a stenosis of sorts in the lungs. There's something obstructing blood flow in the lungs, causing pressure on the front end, less pressure on the back end, right? That can lead to things like thrombosis, right? Formation of clots on the low pressure side.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are at increased risk of thrombosis if the blood is not flowing well, right? If blood just sits around in pools, like if, if I spill a bunch of blood on the floor here, it's going to start to form clots pretty quickly. And that's not just that it's oxygenated, it's that it's pooling. And so when blood pools, it forms clots, right? Um, so if we have reduced blood pressure through the body, right? For example, deep veins of the legs. That's going to cause pooling of the blood in those deep veins. The pooling of the blood then starts to cause an increased likelihood of clotting, right? And that clotting eventually can become an embolism, right? So it's a series, it's a sequelae of things going on now, right? Um, so reduced blood pressure, increased likelihood of clotting, increased likelihood of clotting, increased likelihood of uh, embolism. Thrombosis is the word for a blood clot embolism, right? Um, so that's what we're looking for when we look for a deep vein thrombosis. Great questions. And hopefully um, this stuff is fairly relatable. I mean, it, it, these, you probably, as we've talked about some of this stuff, you may know people that have been infected by some of this stuff. So um, here's definitely one that we will probably all need to know, experience at some point in our lives or know someone that we ex will experience it because of the way, again, that our lifestyle works here in America. We eat a lot of fatty foods, we eat a lot of fried foods, and even though that's linked to things like arthrosclerosis, we continue to make those lifestyle choices. So this is a degenerative condition, right, causing a degeneration of the, of the arteries, right, um, and it's sometimes called hardening of the arteries, right? So I'm calling it a degenerative condition, right, of things like the aorta and the major arteries, right? But the, the vessel wall is becoming hardened, right? We said earlier that we want the blood vessel walls to be flexible so they can accommodate changes in blood pressure, which are needed for survival. If we have them harden, uh, that's a weakening of the artery, in essence. Um, because it's no longer to do this, it's no longer able to do this function of flexibility, right? Um, it is uh, one of the most prevalent diseases in humanity. It is something about our body and the foods that we eat that causes the incidence of this. Um, what we're talking about primor primarily are things like the aorta, coronary arteries, and the cerebral ar arteries, places you would not want this stuff, right? Um, and the reason for that is those are all feeding into major systems of the body. So the aorta is primary, uh, like kind of blood super highway through the whole body. Coronary arteries, of course, affect the functioning of the heart, and the cerebral arteries affect the functioning of the of the brain. So what we're talking about is the potential for things like a, a heart attack or like stroke. They are all tied back to arthrosclerosis, right? And that's all tied back to. A lot of, for, for the most part, the foods that we eat, as well as certain um, uncontrolled risk factors. So it is helpful to know what those risk factors are, because what we're talking about primarily are um, plaques, and those can be what we call fibro fatty plaques, right? Um, and, and so the, these are things like lipids, right? Fats that are then in the blood uh, system causing uh, hardening of the arteries, right? So this is, if you've ever seen those commercials on TV talking about different levels of cholesterol, right? That's what these are talking about. Um, that level, those different types of like LDL cholesterols can contribute to uh, these types of things. Um, this is largely theoretical, but it continues to be kind of informed by um, science and study. Um, and so some of these uh, oxidized LDL is found to be toxic, right? Further weakening the blood vessels. I like this image here on the next page because this kind of gives us a great image of what we're talking about. Um, there again is that um, blood vessel almost seen in an axial slice so we have the adventia on the outside, the media, right, and then we have that lumen, the part at the center where the blood vessel it is allowing the the, the blood the blood cells to flow, right? Um, as we start to get 
uh, occlusion or the buildup of these plaques within the lumen, you can see the blood vessels have nowhere to flow, right? So that's um, how we wind up having things like ischemia and stroke and stuff like that. Um, a frequent way of looking at this is going to be um, either CTA, we can do the MRI, but then going back to the interventional suite and looking at the stenosis interventionally allows us to both diagnosis, uh, diagnose it and treat it there at the same time. Um, so signs and symptoms of this are gonna be things like weakness, chest pain, um, confusion, stuff like that. Um, So um, the, this PTA, which we kind of talked about briefly earlier, um, that's that cardiovascular angiography, um, is, uh, is going to be the most common modality for diagnosis because we can both diagnose and treat it there in the same suite. Uh, we see CTA developing popularity, et cetera, et cetera, like we've already kind of already talked about. But let's kind of get down to the nitty gritty with it and talk about coronary artery disease because they're closely linked, right? These are, these are closely linked. Everything that we're talking about is connected. The, uh, the common sign of this, this angina pectoris is going to be left-sided chest pain with a associated numbness in the left arm, right? Significant clinical sign. So the risk factors we've already mentioned are things like uh, the fatty foods that we eat, um, age itself becomes a risk factor, um, and the increased potential for occlusion of the coronary arteries. Um, diagnosis, we've seen images and the treatment as well. Looking at MI, um, for the most part, it is an acute caused by an acute thrombus of the coronary artery. There's an artery they call the, the widowmaker artery, right? If we throw a clot down that artery, likelihood of MI is very, very high, right? Um, we've mentioned the signs and symptoms, the need for early medical intervention. Um, diagnosis of this, <clears throat> a lot of times it's going to, again, be something done either under angio or perhaps even surgically. Um, and then we can do, if we catch it soon enough, right, or if the myocardial infarction is not severe enough, we may be able to go in, again, under angio and put in a thrombolytic therapy, like these corrosive drugs that break up the clot, right, and restore function to the heart. Now, a portion of the heart may have died as a result of this, and it may require something like embolization, because, again, no, no, th that area of the heart's essentially necrotic, it's just kind of sitting there. We do not need to continue to feed blood into it. All right, aneurysms um, are outpouchings of the vessel wall, and they can, they're can they generally um, described just based on the way that they look, right? So on our textbook in page 115, we see different types of um, aneurysms. And there's even one called like a false aneurysm where you have a clot outside of the blood vessel wall that looks like an aneurysm, but it's not an actual aneurysm. It's not an actual bulging. It just, because of this clot, it looks like it's bulging. Um, so bulging or ballooning of the blood vessel wall. This can be related to um, atherosclerotic disease. It can be related to trauma, infection, congenital defects of the uh, blood vessel itself. Um, and we normally, again, classify them based on the way that they look. Saccular, it looks like a sac, like the, like the blood vessel just has a sac on this one wall. Um, fusiform is the kind of circ circum circumferential aneurysm where the entire, uh, the entire artery has ballooned out. And then dissecting. And the important thing with the dissecting is that you'll be able to see a wall kind of um, where it's sheared off a portion of the... Uh, the blood vessel wall and we have uh, kind of almost like a little tiny room out to the side. So here's what I'm talking about with the 
different forms. Fusiform being kind of a circumferential, all sides are, are, are bulging out. Fusiform, there's just a sac on the one side, a false aneurysm with the clot on the outside, and then dissecting. Um, and the concern uh, with, with these are different, right? Um, it's, if it's fusiform or this uh, uh, saccular type one, we're concerned with the integrity of the blood vessel wall. Will it hold if it continues to balloon outward? So we may put something like a sleeve inside of it, which essentially works like a stent um, to make sure that the blood vessel wall is reinforced. Um, with the dissecting ones, um, the concern is different. The concern is that eventually the blood vessel wall itself could shear off and cause, in essence, a clot or a thrombus made out of the blood vessel wall itself. And if you can imagine that happening in the aorta, how significant that would be. It would be like if there's a traffic jam on the interstate because like five semi-trucks, you know, jackknifed. It would be a significant blockage, right? And nothing's going to get past it. Question. Yeah. They can, and that's kind of what the false one is is looking at. Um, so the uh, certain I've never seen it myself. I have seen a lot of dissecting aneurysms. Well, I saw one in Catalog. It kind of looked like when the contrast went in, there was like a white line in between. Yes. The contrast. Yeah. And one doctor said that it will heal itself, but the other one went ahead and put a stent in. Yeah. So there can be some debate about whether or not it's going to work. I always think about the yin-yang symbol, because that's what it looks like to me. You can see the contrast on either side, but there's like a, a ripple kind of between the, the contrast. Um, and yeah, I don't know how they look at that. They may say, you know, there's not that much contrast on this one side. It's probably, it probably can heal itself. Um, they may, I don't, I don't know how they make those assessments. Great question, though. All right. So looking at triple A, let's look at triple uh, A. What did we find out? So this is just looking at the same thing, but in the area of the thorax, it's the same basic workup. Um, sometimes these ones can be associated with some pain or discomfort. So where with the triple A, totally asymptomatic, if we're talking about a thoracic aortic aneurysm, oftentimes the patient will have some discomfort, things like that. Um, because it's pressing against the heart or against the lungs. We can also see them out in the extremities. Uh, so in the popliteal arteries, this is another very difficult area to, to see. And so um, this can be on either side. It could be on one side. Uh, it could happen in conjunction with a triple A. So the triple A could kind of like just extend down into the uh, areas of the lower limbs. Uh, Diagnosis a lot of times is what we're talking about when we talk about a runoff study, right? Where we, we inject contrast and then we scan, perhaps with a CT scanner, down not just through the heart and the aorta and the abdomen, but down past the bifurcation of the aorta and down through the ends of the toes, right? Because we're trying to see these little tiny arteries there at the extremities. Okay, venous thrombosis, right? Um, this is blood clots formed within a vein, right? Um, this typically happens in the lower extremities, right? Um, so if we've got someone with a fairly sedentary lifestyle, um, uh, sitting around most of the time, we have an increased risk for blood to clot in the deep veins, right? So this is going back again also to our discussion of sequelae related to congestive heart failure, right? There's also increased risk there, right? Because um, if you can imagine if there's, if we don't have very good blood pressure already and now we're sitting, right? What did we just do to our blood pressure? We've just created a place where the blood can't flow. If blood can't flow, it forms clots, right? So that incidence is often tied to other uh, disorders. Um, it can also be tied, if you can imagine, to something like phlebitis. Phlebitis is an inflammation, right, of the vein itself, right, and it normally feels kind of itchy and hot. And the reason it feels itchy and hot is because, again, we're not getting sufficient blood flow through the vein, right, and so there's not oxygen, um, uh, there's not blood flowing back towards the heart, 
right? Um, so uh, this can also be related to a combination of things, which is what we're talking about when we talk about thrombophlebitis, right? Inflammation of the vein caused why? By a clot, right? The clot is causing the inflammation, um, is all that's talking about. Ultrasound is going to be our friend for looking at this because, again, with these deep veins, we can see them sonographically. There's no um, bones that would get in the way. Um, we've just got soft tissue. We've got the, uh, the, the ability to do Doppler studies on these, and we can very accurately see this. We can localize where they're at, and once we have them localized, a lot of times we can treat them again with some kind of thrombolytic uh, agent, or we may put a... Um, clot catching um, net somewhere higher up in the circulatory system, right? And so you've probably been uh, scanning someone or done an x-ray of someone you saw like a little funny looking, look like a coffee filter inside of their body. That is designed to catch clots thrown up from the deep veins of the lower <coughs> extremity, right? So it's, it is working very much like a coffee filter stopping those clots from getting to the heart, to the lungs, to the head places that would affect um, body, uh, the body's health. Here we have uh, contrast studies. Um, on, the, on our left, we're seeing contrast uh, showing uh, clotting in that, the deep veins of the lower uh, leg. And this image on, the, uh, on our right is showing one of those little filter baskets there catching uh, Blood clots. Blood clots. Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, I think it just stops it. I think it just hangs it there on that net. So that wouldn't affect the person if there's like multiple clots just collecting right there? Well, it, it's stopping it from getting to an area where gas exchange can occur. It's stopping it from getting to the lungs. Right. Right. Um, so would it affect the person? Yeah, it's going to slow some of the return blood back to the lungs, but it's preventing it from getting to the lungs. Mm -hmm. That's so a great they question. Go in and remove the clot? I don't know. I don't know if they clean out the basket. That's a great question. Like go and empty out the basket or something, like it's a pool filter or something. Um, yeah, it doesn't say in our text whether they empty out the basket. <laughs> um, I, I just assume that uh, the basket is designed to, to stop it while allowing for flow around the basket. I mean, it's, it's, it's possible, I, I mean, I'm just conjecturing if it's treated with some kind of thrombolytic agent that the basket could kind of eat it, as it were. Yeah. yeah, like a medicated balloon type. Yeah, like my grandma had these and they went in and like whatever they put in kind of like that, it dripped out uh, to break it up and they took it out like three days later. That's awesome. So Miss Baldwin said that she had a family member that was treated with a, a filter basket that dripped out TPA and it allowed it to break up clots at the level of the basket, and then they removed that basket later on. That's the concern is if you had a basket that's treated like that, it would have to be removed. You would not want TPA dripping through your body all the time. That would be a problem. Good example, though. Okay, final thing. Did we have a team that looked at PE? This is a very large clot seen on a chest X-ray. Um, and you can actually see the clot out there on the uh, uh, periphery of the uh, patient's left lung. All right, I've included this slide um, again because it, I don't think it's in our textbook. It has uh, the pathology summarized, but you can see everything that we've talked about today is additive in nature, right? So if we're talking about what its impacts are on uh, imaging, they are all additive. CHF is additive, arthrosclerosis is additive, the septal defects would be additive because of enlarged mediastinum, and you can see how many of these things cause an increase in the heart size itself, um, so we can understand how that would be additive. Um, all right, thank you so much.